Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, the Biofuels in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Join us each week as we explore biofuels in Hawaii and our interviews with some of the various local stakeholders to learn about policy, feedstock and conversion processes, and more. Today, our guest is Ms. Cecily Barnes of Hawaii Electric Industries, Hawaiian Electric Company, or HECO a very important stakeholder in the energy landscape here in Hawaii. So welcome to the show. Thank, thank you. Th thank you for having me. No, thank you. I'm glad we were able to pull it together. Um, it's not always easy to get it scheduled, right? Trying to find the right time. So no, I definitely appreciate you being here. Let's just have a good conversation. Okay, I look forward to it. It's pretty open. So, okay, um, for starters, let's learn a little bit about you. Um, so you 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 are you are the, you're a manager in the fuels department, fuels procurement department. What what is your um, role? And sure, I'll talk a little of that. Yeah, the fuels department is fuels procurement. We negotiate contracts for all fuels, including biofuel, and we also have a, a maintenance element. We have pipelines that our fossil fuel goes to our power plants in. Okay. So we manage that infrastructure and you know. Okay, so procurement and, and infrastructure yes. management, <laughs> regulatory. It's okay, so yep. okay, so it goes pretty deep into the operations side. Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, and how long have you been doing that? Well, I've been doing the fuels and biofuels for about six years, okay. but my career at Hawaiian Electric is 24 years now. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Okay, excellent, <laughs> excellent. So, did it lead up to this, or has it been...? Uh, indirectly, yes. Um, I was managing a large department of uh, basically supply chain, warehousing, purchasing, inventory, logistics, and completed my MBA at Scheidler, uh, my executive MBA, and I was wanting to do something different. So um, asking my boss for some opportunity, it wasn't specifically targeted at biofuel, but that was um, a special project at the time that they needed help on. Sure. So that led to <laughs> so <now laughs> where you, I still sit here today. Now yes. you become the biofuels uh, expert Fuels. now, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, um, however you get there, we appreciate that you're there. So Thank that's you. good. Um, and also give that shout out to UH. Yes. Scheidler. Wonderful program. College of Business. So <laughs> excellent. Good, good, good. All righty. So, so, um, so you've been with HECO for 24 years, but you've been doing the, this particular role for about the last six years. Yes. Okay. Do you like it so far? Of course. It's very interesting. I, I think more, more so than my former work at Hawaiian Electric because it does touch on strategy as we're here to talk about today, you know, with the, bit, the yeah. clean energy initiatives and things like that. So. Oh, good. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. Um, all righty. So initially you didn't have an initial desire to go chase after biofuels. <laughs> it, it was just something that was there and it was an opportunity that was provided. But since you've grown mm -hmm. into it, you really, it's become something that you have more of a focus on as it become, is, what would you um, say your, I guess, personal feeling about biofuels are? Well, I mean, I'd like to see it develop and get off the ground. When we've been endeavoring it now for six or seven years, um, we thought we were going to get farther along a few years back. Um, now we do purchase biodiesel, but in relatively small quantities. But I think with the, uh, the clean energy initiatives and the goals, um, it's very viable to have sustainable, locally produced biofuel with job creation and things like that. There's a lot of opportunity there. So yeah, it, it's exciting to be, be part of the, the future. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, strategizing the future of sustainability for Hawaii, really. Yes. So, excellent, excellent. Well, good, okay. Um, let's switch a little bit more focus on, on HECO. Um, would, okay, general numbers, whether or not you know them, or we'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask you and we'll see and we'll kind of go from there. Okay. Um, about how much fuel in general does HECO purchase on an annual basis? Sure, I can answer that. And I mean, <clears throat> keeping in mind, we have Hawaiian Electric on Oahu, and then there's the subsidiary companies uh, for the Big Island and Maui. Right. Um, so, I mean, here on Oahu, right now we buy about 6 million barrels of fuel oil per year for, for okay. our power generation. Um, that used to be in the, oh, within the last decade, less than a decade ago, it was almost 9 million barrels. You know, so we've seen substantial reduction in consumption because of renewable energy and energy efficiency programs. So about 30% <coughs> reduction. Yeah, it's huge. So. That's great. That's, that's <laughs> right. great in one side, but yeah, I know that impacts mm -hmm. everybody really. Yeah, and then on the other islands, I think collectively with Maui and Big Island, Molokai, Lanai, it's probably about two million barrels in total. We buy a heavy fuel oil and, and diesel and... Okay, so yeah. about, about in total about eight million Maybe barrels nine, a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's all fuels. 
For the utility-owned generators, the yes. utility-owned mm -hmm. generators. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's other independent generation that also uses fuel oil, like Kalalua Partners here on Oahu, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the coal plants and things like that. Okay. But, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's important to understand those those pieces as well. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, of that, what is uh, what is your current percentage of, I guess, petroleum-based versus biofuels? Sadly, biofuels is a very small percentage. I mean, it sounds good when you talk about it in gallons, because we like to talk about biodiesel in gallons and um, fossil fuel in barrels, right? Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. there are 42 gallons to a barrel. Um, we buy from 3 to 4 million gallons per year of biodiesel here on Oahu for our generating plant at Campbell Industrial Park. I think... I, I did the math just before coming here because I thought you might ask. I think it's one percent. <laughs> About one percent, yes. roughly, yes. is biofuels at the moment. Yes. Which I, I mean, you put that into context mm -hmm. as well. One percent at the moment, and that's based on several factors. It has to be produced and available to you in order for you to produce it, and it needs to be at least of a relatively reasonable price, right? Right. So let's let's. I guess let's think about that a little bit. Um, the prices that I understand, and, and from uh, last week or no, two weeks ago, uh, with my interview with Mr. Kyle Data, he was talking mm -hmm. about how at the moment uh, we can say biofuels barrel is about eighty dollars. Is what is what the current going rate is for for a barrel of biofuels? Uh, is that in roughly, roughly? I think he was including the um, federal alternative fuels tax credit that okay. we would call it the blenders credit. That's a dollar a gallon, so that's substantial. I mean, if you're paying three or four dollars per gallon for biodiesel and you get a dollar credit, I mean, that's you know, yeah, twenty twenty five percent off. Um, but that comes and goes. It's set to expire at the end of this year. Oh, wow. So I okay. think I think I heard him say uh, two hundred dollars a barrel. That that's probably more the range of you know the true true cost with, without those types of credits. Without those credits. And then there's also the um, federal program for um, renewable fuel standards with the the RENs. I mean right. that's you know, a lot of detail to get into that. But that's right. again yeah. a federal we've, incentive we've program. We've touched upon that a little bit. Yeah, the and, renewable and our, identification numbers for that. Yeah. Right. So although Hawaiian Electric doesn't take RENs credits, our producers do. Our biodiesel producers do. Yeah. So um, that, that also affords um, somewhat of a discount. Is that yeah. something that we could institute here? Can we bring that here? So it, the it, RINs? Yeah, bring the RINs well, into I mean, Hawaii. In essence, I mean, we it do. should be. Well, we do, because the biodiesel that we buy today has a direct discount to the value of the okay. RINs. So the, the local biodiesel producer here, and then a couple of years ago, we bought from a producer on the mainland, the U.S. mainland. They, they basically monetize those RINs and then pass that monetary value onto us in the way of a price discount. Okay. So we are we are benefiting from it here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to create more of a personally, uh, more of a local based uh, version mm -hmm. of that as yeah, well. That'd be great. Through production and processing and mm -hmm. all that. So that was something that uh, mm -hmm. it's one of the one of the future objectives and goals that I think that the industry is interested in. So right. um, but okay, knowing how it works and knowing that you're currently utilizing it through the means that you can mm -hmm. um, opens that door I think. Mm -hmm. So okay. Um, all right. As far as as far as Hico's perspective on on biofuels, what what is Hico really looking for? Why would Hico be interested in a biofuels versus any fuel? Does Hico care? Yes. And what does Hico care about with regards to biofuels? Yes, we do care. We we actually we love biofuels. <laughs> So, I mean, we're very sensitive to price. I mean, that, that's, I guess, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, but yeah. that's sort of the stumbling block because we don't want to pass on any higher prices to our customers than necessary. But um, in addition to being renewable and sustainable and the things we've sort of alluded to, um, it also has environmental benefits. Biofuel uh, is typically no sulfur, so in theory, uh, air emissions are free of sulfur. Um, and, I mean, we... For the most part, in any of our power generating facilities on the three companies, uh, we can use biofuel in our existing 
generators. So, you know, there's no retrofit required to speak of. And that's one of the um, most important facets of it, even for mm -hmm. the, you know, for, for commercial aviation and for the development of biofuels. What everyone's always looking for is that drop-in, that right. advanced biofuel, that drop-in biofuel. So if we don't have to change anything, just put it in, <laughs> whether it's a mixture or 100%. Right? right. And, I mean, I, you're spot on with the advanced biofuel being a complete drop-in. I mean, we're, we're buying the, the FAME biodiesel, which is not exactly a drop-in, but um, it meets the ASTM standard for biodiesel. But when we started using it 100% at our Campbell Industrial Park facility, that was a new facility. It's a... Um, uh, the manufacturer wouldn't guarantee the operating of the unit on 100% biodiesel. So we took a big risk when we introduced 100% biodiesel and a lot of the um, uh, plant operators and maintenance folks were very hesitant, you know, and oh, this won't work and what about this? And there was a lot of fear in what could happen with the um, equipment or corrosion or even storing it in the tank. You know, would you mm. uh, have spoilage in the tank? But our experience has been now for yeah, the better part of six years that it's a, a seamless operation. So for so, six years. So you've been, mm -hmm. you've been ramping up perhaps for six years now? Well, we've been using it at we've 100%. Been using it. Yeah, I mean, that oh, plant is okay, in that full, plant, yeah, that full plant, operation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. See, okay, so right. that plant, the Campbell plant, mm -hmm. has been full operation, 100% biofuels Correct. for six years. I, I believe so, maybe a little bit longer. <laughs> okay. And, and that's 110 megawatt capacity. And I think at the time, and probably still so, it's the largest utility scale uh, facility using 100% biodiesel. You'll see a lot of people in, use in, a blend. In Hawaii? Or no, in, in the world. In the world. In the world, yes. Okay, that's an important thing. Okay. <laughs> Vila, 150 megawatts. 110. 110. Capacity. 110 megawatt capacity, 100% biofuels, largest in the world. That's an, an On pure Biodiesel. On pure biodiesel. At least at the time we built it. I mean, yeah. I haven't checked in the last couple of years. But yeah, but certainly though, I mean, obviously mm -hmm. that's that's taking a huge step forward. Right. So, okay. And f where do you get all of that? Is that just, it's all locally produced? It is now. Um, initially, uh, we started buying from Renewable Energy Group. They're uh, okay. probably the largest U.S. biodiesel manufacturer. They have a number of facilities throughout the U.S. So they would manufacture it in Iowa and put it in these shipping containers, little plastic, well, big plastic tanks, <laughs> and it would come on a train and on a Matson and show up and go on a truck and unload into our plant. Um, so that's when you started, about six or so years ago. That's where we ago. started, and um, then when you, you, you mentioned, I think, on one of your other programs, Bob and Kelly King, when they right. built their new uh, Pacific Biodiesel Refinery in Hilo, with, um, I think it has five million gallon per year capacity, they were then able, through that new plant to supply us with all of our 100% of our needs. So yeah, we have shifted to a local, I mean, that's a good news story, right? Because that's you definitely. have this idea that, you know, build it, they'll come, you know, put it out there, you know, build the plant, create the demand. I mean, that's what we, we're here for, right? We're the so you were always, you, you were working with them. They were kind of doing this knowing that, okay, we'll build this and you'll buy it. Well, no, thing, there was or? actually no, we didn't make any commitment to them. They built that all on their own. They took a leap of faith. <laughs> There's a risk for you. There's yes, extraordinary risk. And Good. Um, all of our fuel contracts we put out for competitive bids. So they competed. They competed against um, the mainland that firm, REG, that was supplying us, yeah. and um, they were substantially lower cost, and they, they won the award. So, They've um, been able to make it work, yes. and they, they, are, they are very important pioneers in this area. Yes, they are. And, and again, I mean, build it, they will come. I mean, they've built this capacity, and then the, the next piece in the chain is the feedstock, right? So right. Then, then you've got that ability to develop the feedstock market for, for oil seed crops. Exactly, um, exactly. Oh, excellent. So yeah, um, it's exciting. I think too, I mean, what do we look for in a biodiesel? I think that was the earlier question. Um, quality is important and it depends on the generating unit. So our Camel Industrial Park facility is a combustion turbine. So it has a much um, higher demand for quality fuels. Um, and at the time, um, Pacific Biodiesel wasn't able to meet our quality specifications when they were making the, the fuel on Maui and Oahu. Oh, okay. But with the new plant, with the new um, plant. yeah, with the technology that they put in, it's, it's actually a very, very clean um, distilled biofuel. Okay. So biodiesel. that's what enables you mm -hmm. to use it 100% and have had no, no troubles? or Not have, at have all. I mean, but with both suppliers, with REG and Pacific Biodiesel, we've had no issues. There have been no issues, no maintenance fuel. issues, no long-term concerns, no storage issues. No. <laughs> it's just been, it's, it has been a drop-in then. Yes, no, in no. that sense. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. That's yeah. excellent. And that would be our highest standard for power generation. I mean, when you get into a reciprocating diesel engine, we can use um, less refined oils, perhaps. 
um, in our steam boilers. I mean, you could probably burn just about anything, but um, with some caution for um, moisture in the fuel or uh, acidity and, and emissions. I mean, you still want to make sure that you've got right. Um, right, 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 right. your emissions within your air permit. Right. Just like that, our first segment is over. Wow. <laughs> so, see, I, I told you, it goes really quickly, much quicker than you think it is. So. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining us here. Uh, Think Tech Hawaii, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. This is the Biofuels in Hawaii series. We do appreciate you joining us, and we once again say thank you to Professor Brian from Tico for joining us in this conversation. So we'll see you on Monday. Thank you. Okay, this is Hawaii, the state of clean energy, a wonderful show we do, uh, 4 to 4.30 every single Wednesday. And the progenitors of this show, uh, Sharon Moriwaki and Ray Starling to my left. So how's it going? How's it going, Sharon? Do you like the show? I love the show. Yeah. And I hope everybody watches the show and joins in and gives us their comments on clean energy. Yeah. Every week. Every week with incredible yeah. guests and topics and discussion and mostly candor. This, we like this candor. month is all renewable energy and next month we're going to look at procurement. Each month we have a different series yeah. uh, and so it's, it's going very well. We learn well. so much. We keep the oh, public so, so well advised the best we can. Ray, what do you think? Well, I think this is the place where it's happening. This is where we discuss the latest of what, what is going on in the energy world. And, it's a great place to be, a great place to meet some new people that are into the energy world that uh, we, uh, we haven't talked to before. So I'm happy to be here. Okay, this is a, you know, energy is the biggest thing happening in Hawaii, whether you realize it or not, it's gonna affect all of our lives, is affecting all of our lives. And it's like a million things are happening in energy. How could you possibly understand what's happening unless you are informed? This is your way, this is the deal. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, every Wednesday, 4 o'clock, right? Join us. Yeah, I knew you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, the Biofuels in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. And today, once again, please welcome Ms. Cecily Barnes from HECO. Thank you. Uh, we are talking specifically about biofuels and, the, and how HECO has been purchasing biofuels and how the Campbell plant is 100% um, biofuel generated. So that's a huge, huge thing and important to know. And the largest 110 megawatt capacity plant, mm -hmm. largest that we are currently aware of uh, globally. So that's, that's a huge and important thing. So, um, so okay, let's, let's as, as an off taker, and per, which means purchaser, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's important to know, okay, we, we were just talking about what does HECO look for in its fuels, and you were saying, okay, it needs to be a quality, it needs to be clean enough, it needs to uh, fit the standard, the ASTM standard as well, okay. Um, so, okay, that's fine, but it's, what's important to know is the pricing, so we're, let's jump a little bit into the pricing side of that. We started off with, okay, well, well is it actually 200, is it, is it 80, we've got the subsidies that come into play. Well, a lot of people talk about the subsidy thing, and uh, as far as and, and something that isn't clear is petroleum has subsidies that have been there for a while. So the pricing that we pay for our petroleum fuels still has its own subsidy. So when we put a subsidy there for biofuels, it's not inconsistent to say. And what I would like to see and what no one has produced, and I don't know if you mm -hmm. can see this, um, and if the answer is no, then fine, but um, what that comparison is. Uh, and if you're able to give us any insight into the uh, into that difference into the 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 subsidies that are there for petroleum fuels versus biofuels mm. do you have any thoughts or insight into that yes i've heard it say that there are subsidies for petroleum fuels but it's not something that we deal with you know directly okay. i mean we we again competitively bid we contract with the local refineries i'm i'm sure that's at the federal level maybe with oil exploration yeah. i yeah i'm sorry i, I don't know yeah, the answer you know, it's, yeah it's it's the um, it's the 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 oil rigs and all the people who actually right. find oil and mm -hmm. search for oil and and the incentives and why they continue to do that right. as well so yeah that would be a, that's one of the things that i would like to know better or understand better from an economic side of that mm -hmm. is what are the subsidies and what mm -hmm. does that mean for the cost mm -hmm. of the petroleum fuels um and so that we can yeah, and have how could nice that be shifted yeah. to some degree at the federal level, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Or at least, yeah, ma you know, make sure that there were a fair and equal playing field mm -hmm. uh, with, with regard to this. And I, and I totally get all the sides of it, but um, I think going forward from a sustainability perspective, as we're thinking about Hawaii, that's the perspective. That's that piece of that energy security thing mm -hmm. and, and that comes in. Constant supply, 
we're not subject to price shocks up and down. We're not subject to uh, availabilities because we've been able to create throughout the islands enough production to be able mm -hmm. to get what we want and, and mm -hmm. so forth at, at a regular pace, which means that the, operationally the costs can be a constant. That Because just to get your thoughts on this side of it, um, it's important to understand that, that the pricing that you pay is, is, has a direct impact on what the pricing of our electricity is. Yes. And so as the prices are currently at about $50 a barrel, give or take, yeah. a couple of years ago it was $120 a barrel, $140 yeah, a barrel. 140, yes. Exactly. So that obviously has a direct impact. So um, if, if, you can, if you can add into that idea, uh, because not a lot of people quite see it. They, they get it, they hear it. But I hear everybody talking about, well, the reason we want to go to biofuels is because of carbon reduction, is because mm -hmm. of um, our, 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 our global warming concerns. And like, that's all great stuff, but that's not a business case. Right. So from a business case perspective, the reason to go to biofuels needs to be put out there. And the way to connect that to costs mm -hmm. Well, yes. I mean, the cost of oil is a heavy influencer on whether we use biofuel or how much biofuel. I mean, biodiesel often um, for transportation sort of tracks the price of diesel because it's a diesel substitute. So I, I don't know how um, you get out from under the influence of high, you know, oil prices because when they're high, you know, things look more attractive. Right now they're low. I mean, that that's a you know, worldwide thing that's going on right now where right. low oil prices slow down you know renewable efforts whether it's renewable energy renewable fuel so I think um, I mean we have forecasts we have oil forecasts that show oil going back up um, if any of us knew <laughs> when yeah we'd be rich <laughs> <laughs> yeah as you know exactly when and yeah, how right yeah. so I mean I guess I guess it really is a you know way to look at how do you think long term um, to demonstrate that we're not going to pay a whole lot more for biofuel in the future I guess you kind of have to, at some degree, believe that oil prices will be higher, which most people do. And they will, because um, historically right. it has shown. Mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. always, it's always doing this for one reason or another. Right. Uh, some some you know, policy-made reasons versus uh, mm -hmm. other reasons. Mm -hmm. But it's always, it's always been doing that. So we know mm -hmm. it's sort of down now. It's come up a right. little bit, but very little. Mm -hmm. So we're, at some point it will go back up right. again for one reason or another, yeah. right? Yeah, so I mean, subsidies certainly help, bio, biofuel subsidies, and right. then I think you mentioned advanced biofuels. I mean, there's, there's a lot of um, progress that's been made with some of the advanced biofuel technologies. I mean, I'm not an expert in that by any means, but presumably as those get further into commercialization, you know, you also get a production cost that comes down. Yeah. Um, you know, so that, that would certainly help, and um, yeah. more yield, you know, per acre right. uh, for cellulosic type. Um, right. Biofuels, right. so biomass, now, see, now, biomass. You're, now you're speaking <laughs> the biofuels language and all that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, no, so. I mean, you know, it, it, it sort of depends. But then, you know, putting price aside, clearly, you know, any policy mandates or, or subsidies, you know, help push the market along. Right. You know, so, I mean, the reason we're burning 100% biodiesel at, at Camel Industrial Park is because the Public Utilities Commission told us to, right? So we're mandated to do that. Um, similarly, we're constructing a new 50 megawatt facility at Schofield Generating Station, um, sort of in partnership with the Army. Mm -hmm. And the Army, you know, said they want to be renewable. So they're the ones that are driving this requirement that all of the diesel fuel that will be used there is to be a 50% biodiesel. So we'll have biodiesel at that, that facility. That's a 50 megawatt? Is yes, okay. mm -hmm. 50 megawatt capacity. Uh, and that's been approved by the Public Utilities Commission. Um, Probably, I mean, the groundbreaking for the, you know, where they go and bless everything that's occurred. I think it will be in operation 2018, so soon. Okay. I mean, you know, it's, it's well underway. But again, it's a policy, right? I mean, the Army, it was important to them that it have a renewable aspect, so we're doing it anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. then you look at the 100% um, renewable by 2045. I mean, those types of things drive behavior, and then I think it really calls into question um, of the value. I mean, what value is it to have a renewable future, a sustainable island? And maybe people are willing to pay a little bit more for that. Um, and, and it's always about the short term. Right. Pay a little bit more in the short term mm -hmm. so that it levels itself off. Because one of the points that, that uh, Kyle Dada was saying is, as you see those prices go up and down, mm -hmm. the relative cost 
of what that is compared to a constant cost, and that's the objective. Right. If the constant cost is higher than our current cost, but the relative, but where is that in a relative cost? Mm -hmm. So your average, if you're currently paying 50, but you've also paid 140, right. your average is somewhere above and below that. So where does that fit within that $80? Mm -hmm. And how do we begin to make that decision, bring that down a little bit more so that, you know what? You grow it, I'll buy it. Right. kind of a thing. It gets, mm -hmm. gets larger and larger. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to the incentives that are, are there to help. So, mm -hmm. um, so okay. Let's... What would you say as far as, you know, fr from the purchasing side, from, the, from a purchaser of fuels perspective, mm -hmm. looking at biofuels, what do you think some of the barriers are at the moment? Pricing is one of them. Mm -hmm. Yes, wanted to make sure that it's a it's a competitive price. Are there other barriers that go along with that? I mean, uh, sure, and I and I guess you know it depends too. Again, if we talk about traditional biodiesel that Pacific Biodiesel is refining, I mean, like I said, they took a leap of faith. They you know built it. They've got the feedstock. We're buying it. Those are typically short-term procurement. But I think to do some of the other things, you know, to invest in agriculture, say, you know, to dedicate acres to grow uh, an energy crop, whether that be biomass, biogas, biofuel, you need long-term commitments of the off-taker, right? So, right. I mean, I think um, that's a barrier for people. Presumably, that's where the utility could possibly come in and offer um, a longer-term guarantee to take it. Especially but, if, it's um, at a, if it's at that, if a slightly lower price, if you negotiate that, say, okay, well, if you mm -hmm. do five years, if you do 10 years, mm -hmm. if you can guarantee this production right. at this pricing, right. that helps support. As a, uh, with that, though, one of the questions, and I'll jump th on this mm -hmm. one, one of the questions and concerns that people have is like, well, if you're going to grow feedstock for fuels, that means you're not growing food. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I, I'd like to hear your general thought on this, I think that it can and should be done in tandem. Right. And I mean, that's everything I hear locally is, you know, when you talk about crops, as you just mentioned, I mean, they, they sort of coexist, you yeah. know. So, I mean, um, like you have the pang pangamia trees right. that you could have livestock grazing through the trees or... Um, exactly. And you have multiple or, products you know, that you crops can that have multiple it. products, exactly. Yeah. So, I, you know, I don't think it's an either or debate. Um, right, but that's but one of the challenges. So when people immediately say, well, perception. one of those yeah. barriers is mm -hmm. you're, if you're going to grow that, you're not growing food. Mm -hmm. It's not actually a barrier. When you look at the amount of potential land that we have between OHA and the state and mm -hmm. a lot of other um, just landowners, right. it's the opportunity to use the land is there if we can create that relationship and that partnership right. so that we can then grow more food mm -hmm. and, and it yeah. supplements and course, each other. Yeah. And of course water. I mean, I heard you talk on your other show about, about water. I mean, but, yes. but that's the nice thing too about some of the energy crops, you know, that they maybe don't require as, as much premium land or, or as much water as other crops, you know, so yeah. you can grow them on more marginal lands. Okay. Um, so, yeah. so, okay, so basically pricing, um, uh, resource availability, the ability to have enough of a quantity, what the Department of Logistics Agency calls operational volumes. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you've got that ability to buy it because it's available to you. Um, knowing that it's a drop-in and that it's not something you need to change your, your equipment for. Right. All of these things, and so all of these barriers that used to be are all kind of fading away a little bit. So mm -hmm. the final barrier that exists is still that cost. Right. that current policies and future policies can impact as mm -hmm. regards to incentives and subjects and so forth. So. All right, well, that, I think that, so again, we're at the end of our show, okay. just like that. So thank you very much for joining us. There's, we can go another hour worth of conversation with this, but I truly appreciate that. Thank you okay. so much for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Performers. Once again, thank you to our guest, Mr. Barnes from Pico. Thank you to the staff and the crew of Think Tech Hawaii. They all are wonderful people. We will see you, I believe we'll see you next week uh, to be determined by my dad at town. Aloha, see you.